warm welcome to all of you. Today I I would like to say a few words about this episode. A few days ago I left a post on the forum stating that I apologized for being away for a few days because I felt stress and uh, pressure at the workplace and in my life and therefore I couldn't freely post and stay a while away from the farm and I didn't know it was going to cause such a stir so it's a wonderful occasion here for me to along with Jundo and after Jundo's remarkable um, post and, and video to, to say a few things just uh, about it. Now, what is to be a teacher? Basically, it's not to pause to give a picture of yourself, but to share with great intimacy and truth your own practice with others. People that I've been very fortunate to practice with and to learn a lot from my students during retreats in England, in France. People I met in countless doksan in Japan, all over. Well, these guys, they can tell you. Did they, had a, did they have a Buddha of equanimity talking to them, lecturing them? Nope. They had a bloke, a fool sometimes, that just shared his life, his breath, his blood, his bones and marrow. So they had my tears, my laugh, my grin. They had my thoughts, my silence, in intimacy. In the process of teaching, I am taught. This is what we call Menju, the meeting of two minds. And it's done without pausing and pretending. What the F with that? I don't care. Number one. So I've got nothing to hide, really. It's all there. Go on my blog. What you see is what you buy. It's not perfect. It's like it's ordinary. Now, some of us have been brought up in a culture of um, superheroes. And we develop an idea of a practicing teacher, a Buddha, in practice as somebody rock solid, you know, very stable, very strong. A kind of body and mind of equanimity, unmovable, can't shake it, it just stays there, it's reliable, 100%. Well, I'm glad to say that we are not meant to be like a dead piece of wood. We don't have to be carved like statues. We are living beings. Flesh and blood, emotions, stuff happen in our life. We go through ups and downs. I do, of course. Jundo, of course. Any teacher I met has done and still do. Now, if you look into the literature of the past, if you look into the poetry of Dogen, of Ryoka, of Isa, it's full of it. Does that disqualify these guys? Does that make them wrong? Quite the opposite. They get closer. And what do they do? They actually not 
dealing with a sort of preconceived idea of enlightenment, they're able to go through the roller coaster of life with this big vision, all embracing, which is beyond the up and downs, the low and high, at once, all together. And they take these emotions as a teacher, not necessarily as a poison that you've got to get rid of, to spit out. There is an element in our path which is pretty tantric, I must say. Now, not just in the rituals of, you know, sutra, sort of juggling and uh, chanting the names of very complicated bodhisattvas. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how we are digging deep and we're dealing with poisons and negativity to turn it into enlightenment and enlightened activity because there's no enlightenment apart from enlightened activity practice. That's it. So Zen has something to do with discipline. You start there. That's the Theravada path. You might grow into the Mahayana, this way of all encompassing, just beautiful compassion and love and selfless action. But you also, at the same time, because the three Yanas are not just following each other, they happen sort of within the same realm. You transform poisons. You work in that alchemy, which is so important. There you are, guys. So nothing to hide. And I'm glad, in a way, because that made a point. If you look after a superhero, go and shop somewhere else. Oh, you're going to have to buy it for, or for real. It's just, you know, it's for sale. Generally, gurus are selling themselves a big price. Sometimes the freedom, your freedom, is the price. Often money. I don't ask for money. I don't ask for freedom. I ask for sincere people. People that really want to look deep and to look, to dig deep. Now, I'm also a very bad artist. A writer, a poet. And as an artist, and also an actor, a stage manager, as an artist, I dig deep, very deep. That's my job. So I'm not the man necessarily you see watching television and, you know, relax on the... Well, yes, yeah, sometimes I do. But I've got some questions. I've got some really, really deep questions. And I'm getting, getting to the bottom of it all the time. And there's no bottom. And it just carries on and on and on and on and on. But when I meet uh, these people that think they are highly spiritual and they try to project and you know a, a guru like sort of hold on give me a break <laughs> it's not about that it's about life it's about unmasking the ego dropping the appearance it's about finding the fray little thing behind, maybe, but so big, so huge, if you look in this ordinary thing. I'll tell you a story. You know it. You know it all. It's called The Wizard of Oz. That's presumably the best Zen book written in the West, really. Hmm? Of course. Look at it. Dorothy, lovely girl, lost in that kingdom, which is a bit weird with a witch that terrifies everybody. And she is escorted with the three poisons. You know the tin man, the lion, the scarecrow? The three poisons, just there. And all along they go for a journey, a journey of discovery and change. They're gonna find the Wizard of Oz. And the Wizard of Oz 
is that powerful, mighty voice, the thing that terrifies everybody. But for the lion to find courage, for the others to find intelligence, wisdom, what does it take? It takes to unmask the wizard. To find that behind that mighty voice and this sort of illusion, the self, there is a little man, much more interesting, much more true, it's just them. And that discovery is enlightening. So please, if you have time, read again The Wizard of Oz. Beautiful book. If you have time, look into your expectation. We're not in a film of George Lucas here. We're not dealing with Spielberg. We're not dealing with the big mythologies, uh, myths, I should say, of the West. Um, superheroes? No, no, it's nothing of the sort. What makes your life so amazing? Well, sometimes a joy, and sometimes the sweat and the tears. All the great teachers are just ordinary. And if sometimes they're sad, and they can be sad, they always have a consciousness that tells them, <laughs> actually, all is well. It never leaves me. And the second thing, they recover very fast, very fast. It's just, I would say the, the way we move from emotion to emotion is faster than most people would. And I'm sure that you guys, who are great teachers too, can do exactly the same. You can allow yourself to change. You can allow yourself to let go. Not reject. Stay with it. Look at it. And you see, it's going to turn. So thank you for being patient and for listening to what I had to say today. Hopefully it's been helpful. Hopefully it's been helpful. <laughs> My English is so stupid. Anyway, <laughs> it's been a long day. It's, uh, wow, yeah, it's 10 o'clock. And I've been at it since five. So I think I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, and uh, speak to you next time. But The Wizard of Oz, great book, really. Oh, one more thing. The Bodhisattva. Hmm. You are it. And the Bodhisattva is not somebody that looks on the way up the suffering and consider the suffering from a distance. He is the one that embraces the suffering. He totally, utterly is one with the cries and the suffering of the world. The Bodhisattva cannot remove himself or herself from it. That quality, that courage, it's you. Don't be afraid. Thank you for your teaching.